Sweetwater here and welcome to five famous ACDC riffs that are frequently played wrong. Or perhaps a better title would be five famous ACDC riffs played the Angus way. We started with the opening riff from Howl's Bells from the best-selling hard rock album of all time, 1980's Back in Black. Now the first two ways I played it, the notes were right, but I wasn't playing it where Angus plays it. I was playing it up in open position and I've seen numerous transcriptions and numerous lessons showing you how to play it that way. Like I said, it's not really wrong because the notes are correct, but it does sound different where Angus plays it, which is down here. Now, I guess the reason a lot of people transcribe it that way is because most people think that ACDC's catalog is 99.9% .9 just big open power chords. So you figure, hey, I can use open chords for this, so that's how I'll play it. But Angus plays it as I've just done. Let me show it you slowly. <laughs> Only does it sound better in my humble opinion when played higher up the neck like that, but it's also a darn sight easier to play because it's minus a lot of the stupid string skipping I was having to do up here. In fact, those first two takes took a while because they're harder to play than the right way, which is the Angus way. So case closed, let's move on. Before we move on to the next riff, however, let me quickly explain to you why I'm 120% certain I've just showed you exactly how Angus plays Hell's Bells. What happened was this, during the 90s, Guitar World asked me to do a private lesson with Angus, and of course I said yes, and that's what he did. He showed me how he plays his stuff, and one of the first things he looked at was Hell's Bells because he'd seen people playing it in the open position, which is not how he does it. The piece was called The Right Way, this is the opening page. There he is with the SG. Next up is another cut from Back in Black. This is You Shook Me All Night Long, and this is the opening riff played a way a lot of books say it's played and a lot of experts on YouTube say it's played. And if you watch Angus play it, the notes once again are right, but they're playing it in the wrong place. This is how they say it should be done. Are you ready? <laughs> but no carrot. The notes are 100% correct, but where it's being played is not where Angus plays it. He plays it higher up on the neck, and that gives him several advantages. Number one, it's slightly warmer sounding. Number two, he can put a nice vibrato on the opening chord, which is one of his penchants. And also, there's not that open G string ringing that can get a tad annoying. So this is how he plays it. That's a ticket. Not as good as Angus could play it, but close enough for rock and roll, certainly good enough for me. Now there's just one part that I'm not 100% sure that I'm playing it correctly, and that's at the very end of the first turnaround, because I've never found footage of Angus playing it live. Whenever he plays it, the stage is always dark on all the footage I've seen. So I've been using a slide from the third fret to the fourth fret on a D string like this. You could, of course, use a hammer-on. Same difference, so if you've got a strong pinky, go for it. This is what this would sound like. Either way is good. Anyway, now you know how Angus plays it, let's move on to riff number three. 
Next up is Angus's cool, mellow, finger-plucked intro to the title track of For Those About To Rock. Now, when we were doing the column together, I specifically asked him about this part because I had two different transcriptions, both of which sounded correct, but both of which were quite different. Let me show you what they were. This is the first one. sounded pretty good to me even with my dodgy playing and as you probably noticed it had the open B string ringing as a drone throughout I was plucking it along with what I was doing on the G and E strings which we'll get onto in a minute now the next version was the same thing except this time the drone was the B note at the 12th fret on the same string so same thing but the B an octave higher this is what this one sounded like <laughs> Once again, sounds pretty good. So which is it? The open B drone or the 12th fret octave higher B drone? And here's the answer. Neither. This is what Angus said. Nah, mate. Both of those are way too hard. Our stuff isn't that difficult to play. In fact, he went on to say that if you see a transcription or you have a lesson with someone and they show you a riff of ours that's hard to play, chances are they've got it wrong. So this is how he showed me he plays it, and he doesn't use the B string at all. He leaves one finger at the 11th fret on the G string throughout as the drone, and then he's just moving around on the high E string. He goes from the 11th fret to the 10th fret, to the 14th fret, to the 12th fret. And what he's playing is this, he's playing four bars of eighth notes. So he starts off with 11 and 11, on the two strings and he plays that 16 times with accents on every third beat so it's kind of a three against four feel then he moves to the 10th fret on the high E string plays that six times then he moves up to the 14th fret on the high E string with his little finger and plays that just three times and that's actually an octave to the F sharp and then he moves to the 12th fret and plays that seven times so here it is the Angus way 16 6 three, seven. Here goes. Cool. Now here it is a little bit slower. Same thing. Excellent. Simple is the way to go. Keep it simple, stupid. The KISS principle always, always works. Hurrah! Next up is riff number four, and this is from Sin City on the Parage album. This is how I've seen someone who's really, really good playing on YouTube, and the chords are 100% correct. It goes E5, B5, D5, A5, then E, G on the open E string. So it goes like this. This is how this guy plays it. Sounds cool, but ACDC don't use the B5 bar chord where he's playing it. They also use an open A and open D chord as well. So how they play it is this. Like Angus said, it's got to rock. You've got to be able to get your teeth into it. And that way you certainly can. The other one doesn't have any teeth, if truth be told. It's correct, but it sounds relatively anemic when you play them back to back. Check it out. Versus Sold. To illustrate the point further as to just how important those tough sounding open chords are, as Angus said, those buggers ring forever and they sound huge. He showed me Problem Child with power chords and then open chords. This is it with power chords. <laughs> Like Angus says, it loses its toughness. This is the tough version using open chords. Yep, 
Yeah, to quote Angus, that did in fact sound much, much tougher, and it felt tougher too. In addition to the bigness of the open chords, another thing Malcolm and Angus did to very, very good effect is they hit the strings really hard. As Angus told me, don't tickle them, hit the buggers hard. Just to close the subject on open chords though, even though Malcolm and Angus used them to wonderful effect in many, many, many great riffs and songs, they also used bar chords really, really well. Like the riff from What Do You Do For Money, Honey, for example. Check this out. What a great riff. Wish I'd written it, but they did. Darn it. And last but certainly not least, we come to riff number five. In fact, there is a riff six because there is an elephant lurking in this room that I have to address. So anyway, the next riff is from Power Age again. And this is from the almighty Riff Raff. Now, this is how I used to play this riff. Played it for years. And guess what? I was wrong. But it sounds right. Check it out. Like I said, sounds really good. And that's why I played it for years. Then a friend who had much better ears than me and was a better player said, I think he's playing an octave A at the start after the three chords. So instead of going using the open A after the three chords, my friend figured he was playing the second fret on the G string like this. So I started listening really carefully and I could hear it, but I wasn't 100% sure because it passes really quickly. So I did the usual thing. I disappeared down the rabbit hole known as YouTube. And I watched, and I watched Angus's picking very carefully, and yeah, he was definitely doing something that wasn't the open A. And then, after a long, long time, I found footage of him jamming with Guns N' Roses in 2017 in the Netherlands, and the tone he had and the way it was filmed made it beyond all reasonable doubt that he was, in fact, doing what my friend said he was, playing the A note after the three chords at the second fret on the G string. So this is the correct way to play it, my friend. So I'm going to do it slowly first and then at speed. And now here it is at speed. Well, the very best I can do it. I don't have anything like the precision that Malcolm and Angus do, but uh, this is my best shot. Here goes. <laughs> Phew! Good enough for me. And as mentioned, before I leave, here's the bonus, The Elephant in the Room, the title track to Highway to Hell. I played this wrong for many years. In fact, I played it on stage wrong because they don't play a D chord like most of us did initially. They actually put an F sharp on the low E in with it, which gives it that magical Angus Malcolm vibe. So instead of being this, it's this. So this is how the riff goes. This is how I played it wrong. Close, not played great, but wrong because the D is wrong. As we all know, because it's been talked about on many, many YouTube episodes from many, many people, it is that chord. And it's played like this. Get it? Close enough for rock and roll. But there's more to it than that. It's not just that chord, it's the timing. Let me explain. When we discussed this riff, Angus made a big deal about how important rhythm was to those guys. He said this was Malcolm saying, if it doesn't swing, it doesn't mean a thing. And this thing swings if you play it correctly. And what's funny is a lot of people don't play it correctly. They get the chord right, but they get the timing wrong. There's a guy who does great YouTube guitar content called Paul Davids from the Netherlands, and he went into this in detail. In fact, he put several people playing that riff side by side in alleged unison, and they were all hitting in different places, even though they were playing in the same tempo. That's how important the groove is. And what it is, there's a lot of ups. If we count one, two, three, four, the one, two, three, and four are downs. The ands in between we'll call up. So it's down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. 
how that riff goes is up, down, up, up, down, up, up, down, up, up, down, up, 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 down. Got it? Now, there's a saying that says, if you can hum it, you can play it with a riff like this. If you can tap it, you can play it. Let me explain. This is the riff's tempo. One, two, three. If you can do that, you can play the riff. So just beat on a table. And there you have it, my friends. That concludes five famous ACDC riffs played the Angus way, plus a bonus. If you can tap it, you can play it when it comes to Highway to Hell. So the only thing left for me to do, I guess, is to say thanks for watching, and I'm gonna play out the Angus way. See ya! <laughs>